all three of Canada's leading literary prizes. The Governor General's Award for Nonfiction Book Writing, the National Magazine Award for Political Writing, and the National Newspaper Award for Column Writing. He has also won the Hyman Solomon Award for Excellence in Public Policy Journalism and became an Officer of the Order of Canada in January 2000. Mr. Simpson has published eight books. Most recently, he has, he has co-authored Hot Air, Meeting Canada's Climate Challenge, which was published in 2003, sorry, 2007. He has also written numerous magazine articles for a variety of publications and has spoken at dozens of major conferences on an assortment of domestic and international issues. Mr. Simpson has also been a regular contributor to television programs in both English and French and completed a two-hour documentary for the CBC to accompany his book, Star Spangled Canadians. He has been a guest lecturer at several universities, including Oxford, Edinburgh, Harvard, Princeton, Brigham Young, John Hopkins, Maine, California, and more than a dozen universities within Canada. He has been awarded honorary doctorates of laws from the University of British Columbia, the University of Western Ontario, the University of Manitoba, the University of Moncton, and Queen's University. Mr. Simpson has taught as an adjunct professor at the Queen's Institute of Policy Studies and the University of Ottawa Law School. He is now Senior Fellow at the University of Ottawa's Graduate School of Public and International Affairs and lives in Ottawa with his wife, Wendy, and they have three children. I'd also like to note um, that at the end of his talk, Mr. Simpson will be taking uh, questions for the floor, so if you can keep that in mind uh, while he's speaking. And now, without any further ado, I'd like to invite Mr. Simpson to speak to us on the globalization of the Canadian mind. Thank you, Jenna. May I first of all apologize for the fact that I have uh, the remnants of a central Canadian chest cold. I know you never get damp weather down here, so you'll understand if I sound a bit froggier than usual and if I cough occasionally, I hope you'll forgive me. Thank you, organizers, very much. It's an extremely impressive conference that you've put together. I love being with the students. Um, Older folks are okay too, but I love to be with the students. Speaking of older folks, I'm honored to be in the presence of some of the uh, titans, if I can put it that way, of uh, the study of uh, Canadian public administration, uh, Professor Pross and Professor O'Coyne, who I saw last night. I don't know exactly where they're sitting, but it's an honor to be with them. And it was a surprise and an honor to be with Herman Backfuss. Herman and I go back uh, many, many decades is the right word, because in the late 19, I'm giving away our ages here, but in the late 1960s, uh, from 1967 to 71 or thereabouts, Herman and I were in the political science department together at Queen's University, and we took courses together, and were friends then. He was the scholarly serious guy, and I was the guy who did the football games on the radio and was in student politics and all those diversions. So you could have guessed then that he'd become the scholar and I'd become the gadfly, and that's the way it's turned out, but it's very nice to see him, and I followed his career from afar, and I know that uh, Dalhousie's loss was uh, UVic's gain, mind you. Um, knowing a little bit about the weather in Victoria, <laughs> I think there's probably another motive involved there. I want to talk this morning to you as you begin your deliberations about <clears throat> something that uh, I think is extremely important for our whole country, and that is to situate us uh, in the whole world. This is not a talk about foreign policy. And you know that uh, in the church sometimes the uh, preachers uh, take a piece of gospel and they talk about it, and I want to use that this morning by reminding you of a slogan that is on the wall of every chapter store and as somebody who writes books and therefore goes in expectantly to chapter stores and then is deflated to see that the books aren't very well displayed I've been in a lot of stores and in every chapter store across the country there's a slogan on the wall that says the world needs more Canada now it's I suppose a very clever marketing uh, slogan it appeals to our patriotism we have in the last number of years produced a variety of authors whose books have become well known around the world. So it makes Canadians feel good about their literature and I suppose about themselves. And it reflects a national conceit. 
that Canadians are welcomed, respected, and needed abroad. The inference being that the world would be a much better place if Canadians were more present in it, if we could kind of run the show a bit more, the world would be a better place. I think the slogan, however, every time I see it, is exactly backwards. Uh, the world may or may not need more of Canada, but Canada needs a lot more of the world, a lot more of it. I'm not sure that the hill tribes that I was hiking with in February in northern Thailand I'm not sure that the people who live in the arrondissement of Paris, I'm not sure that the people who are struggling in Kenya these days really think much about whether the world needs more Canada. This, this is a kind of national conceit of ours. But our future well-being as a country of only, only 33 million people, I think depends vitally and urgently upon establishing by all means and through all available institutions, the reality, not just the reputation, not just the reputation, but the reality of being among the most internationally connected countries on the planet. It's in this sense that I say that Canada needs more of the world. In other words, we can best prosper uh, if we go global in our thinking and in our institutions. We can't become the most powerful country in the world, militarily or politically, that would be absurd. We don't even need to become the world's quote-unquote richest country because the definition of material riches can often be quite deceiving. But rather, I'm suggesting that we should try to have it within our means, and we should try very much to have it within our policies, and I'm talking to people who are future and actual policy makers to connect this country to the world as few other countries are connected. Because apart from our bounteous natural resources, it's only, I think, by becoming more global in our acting and our thinking and recognizing that in an increasingly globally interconnected world, the countries with the best equipped workforces will succeed it's in these areas that our potential competitive advantages lie. And in a country that's often searching for a national vision, this is one. I think it's compelling and it's clear and it's waiting for political expression. We have some of the tools that we need to be successful in this kind of mission. We lack others. For example, we have as domestic official languages, two of the world's leading international languages. We have a multicultural society that can connect us with many different corners of the world, a multiculturalism that is growing all the time. We already have a trade-dependent economy. We are more dependent on trade as a percentage of our GNP than the other G8 countries. And we have many role models, as uh, you look around, of Canadians who are leaders in different parts of the international world. And we do have at home Canadians who do understand the prerequisites of global thinking. And we enjoy a kind of uh, positive, if somewhat blurry, international reputation at a time when, sadly for them, our American friends, and I take no pleasure in saying this, find that their own standing in the world has precipitously declined. And we have something else. We spent the better part of two decades struggling to line up our economic and our uh, social policies. And when they weren't properly aligned, uh, we ran huge deficits over more than two decades that distended public finances and robbed us of our ability to make strategic public investments because so much government revenue was necessarily and sadly being shoveled into debt repayment. But now we are the only G8 country with a solid balance sheet. So just as we correctly 
lined up social and economic policies since 1995, and that was a great national achievement. That was perhaps the greatest national achievement of the last 10 years. Aligning domestic policies and institutions today for tomorrow's global reality should be the challenge for this in successive decades. Global reality means this, to give some practical examples. We can't solve our environmental issues alone. Our climate, our air, our oceans, and some of our rivers, for example, they all depend upon international cooperation. We can't compete as effectively as we need to compete in a very tough global economic environment if we don't have more large, in my judgment, Canadian-based and Canadian-owned companies because the fate of a branch plant is to be an appendage, not a leader, in the international economy. And we can't meet the demands of China and India and Brazil who want a better life for their citizens and whose national ambitions are not going to disappear just because they're giving us a tough time economically. Those things aren't going to happen. And we can't prosper against that competition by lowering our wages. We can only do it by improving our skills. And we can't do innovative, we can't do cutting edge research, we can't make discoveries and commercialize them unless we retain great brains here and put them in contact with the best, best brains overseas. We can't, in other words, retreat into protectionism, build firewalls, or continue with comfortable old ways of doing things, or else ours is going to be a gentle decline heading towards mediocrity in a world that chapters notwithstanding does not need Canada, no matter what our smug national self congratulation might sometimes suggest. And this new way of thinking, this new kind of agenda, is not a dog-eat-dog -dog one. It's not survival of the fittest, because the projection of our values, or what Abraham Lincoln once called the better angels of our nature, is not inconsistent with the pursuit of our interests. For example, more and better targeted, and I underline that word, more and better targeted foreign aid can make for a more stable world, which is in our interest and is consistent with our values. Investments at home in sustainable development can make us, over time, be more competitive and assist the global environment. Investments at home in access to learning and skills development and facilitating, for example, the domestic accreditation of foreign credentials is not only consistent with our values, but it is very much in our interests. Now, in my view, no political party fully grasps this challenge. They are too busy, heads down, scrabbling for political advantage, which means finding out through polls what the people are deemed to want today and delivering it to them tomorrow with their own money, the GST cut being a prime example. So it does take leadership of a rare kind to set your sights beyond the preoccupations of today and frame a vision of the future that's going to be ridiculed by some, sloughed off as irrelevant by others, dismissed as twaddle by still others, and derided for not dealing with the problems of today. So needless to say, this kind of vision, this kind of leadership is not readily found at the national political level as we speak. But I believe, as somebody who travels back and forth across the country a lot and marries what he hears from thoughtful people with what's happening in the world, I think there is a kind of constituency waiting to be mobilized for this kind of vision, especially among the younger members of our society, people such as many of you in the room, and that a political leader who articulated this kind of vision for the country would find an audience. Maybe I'm just being naive. I mean, it wouldn't be the first time. Because I do remember, as some of you do, that in the last election campaign, foreign policy, which is a subset of what I'm talking about, 
was never debated, let alone mentioned, not by the parties, not during the televised debates, not by the media. It was actually very sobering and discouraging for people delivering the kind of message that I am today to have watched that campaign. But this internationalist project requires us understanding the way in which, whether we like it or not, the world is rushing in on us, the way in which our industries and our economy, the way in which our air and water, our forests and fields, our universities and colleges, our governments, our scientific research and cultural producers, how almost every aspect of our daily lives and our future is increasingly tied or influenced by the drives, pressures, treaties, negotiations, the sheer weight of the world upon us. And either we're going to let that weight shape us, and some of us will regardless of what we do for a country of 33 million people, or we try to shape it ourselves and prepare for it and at least turn some of it to our advantage. And this kind of thinking, this kind of connectedness means reconsidering domestic arrangements, asking ourselves individually and collectively this question, how will the decision that we're making today allow us better to thrive in the increasingly competitive global world of tomorrow? And to influence one hopes for the better, not just the material well-being of ourselves, but the justice, fairness, and sustainability and equity of that world, because connectedness means not just, as I said, the enhancement of our interests, but also the projection of our values. And unfortunately, our federal, our political arrangements often work against that kind of thinking. Federal-provincial relations, which uh, you and I were studying a long time ago at the Institute of Intergovernmental Affairs at Queens and taking courses from some of the eminent professors there, federal-provincial relations, then as now, are often about carving up money and squabbling over jurisdictions. And a huge amount of attention in my adult lifetime has been spent by governments, both federal and provincial, on those kinds of issues. Frankly, the world couldn't care less. And they mean almost nothing in terms of meeting these international global challenges that I'm talking about. Quebec separatism, which has again been part of my adult life as a journalist, has been an immense distraction for decades. And our parliamentary system, with its highly adversarial structure, seems to put a premium on the immediate and the, and we're to blame for some of this, the sensational, certainly the partisan, over long-term considerations for the consequences of today's actions. <coughs> now, there was a former, <coughs> excuse me, speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives. He came from Massachusetts, so some of you may have heard of him, named Tip O'Neill. And he coined a phrase that's become a cliché, <coughs> that all politics is local. And when you're running for election every two years, as they have to in the U.S. House of Representatives, they understand what he's talking about. What he meant was, you've got to get elected every two years, you have to be extremely attentive to the local needs of your district, so you live or die politically on local issues. And I'm not so naive as to believe that there isn't an element of truth in that, as there is in many cliches. But I might suggest in turn that if you think about it for more than a brief moment, much of what's polit in politics today is actually global in the sense that local issues, whether they're understood as such or not, are influenced by and interconnected with global trends, often in ways that aren't seen clearly by local electorates. Let's just consider a kind of a favorite subject of mine, um, because reference was made to the book that I wrote on climate change. There we have the classic tragedy of the commons, writ global. No one country was or is responsible for the degradation of the commons, which is the atmosphere, and no one country's actions will solve that problem. 
even if we do, we, Canada, do much more, as I believe urgently we should, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, remember that every week in China a new coal-fired hydro plant is opening. Every week. So there has to be a global response tied to a series of local responses in order for all of us on the planet to get a grip on this problem. And there will be, in fact, there already is a market for clean slash green technology that is growing and will continue to grow by leaps and bounds as we attempt to get a grip on this problem. And the winners are going to be the ones who have the best products, as the Germans and the Danes, for example, now do because they've been acting on this file in terms of wind and solar technologies, and as the Norwegians are, because they got their companies, they insisted that they sequester their offshore oil emissions under the North Sea, and so they are the world leaders. They took local action to deal with their share of a global problem, and now they're the world leaders in that technology. And we're still talking. There's going to be, in due course, whether the world needs wants to wait on Canada or not, there's going to be, in due course, if not a global, then a transnational or supranational market, a cap-and-trade system for carbon. In other words, decisions will be taken locally around the world, but the economic space for these decisions isn't going to be local. It's going to be regional, national, or international. So you extend that argument a bit. Canada's political space is Canada. You can look at a map and say there is Canada and there are the boundaries. But our economic space is essentially North America because 75% of our exports go to the United States. That fact, and it is a fact, has driven Canadian governments, often in the teeth of very strong domestic opposition, to seek to regulate that economic space through agreements with the Americans and latterly the Mexicans. I'm going to take you through the history of free trade. Suffice it to say that for all the divisions that we had at the time of entering into the original Canada Free Trade Agreement, to the best of my knowledge, there is no politician of consequence anywhere in Canada, regardless of political strife, left, center, or right, that now argues on public platforms for tearing up the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement that became NAFTA in due course. Some people grumble about it, but nobody proposes to tear it up. It's a fact of life. Economic reality, i.e. an aspect of the global reality, imposed itself on Canada's political space. But there is an endemic tension between political and economic space because people in a political entity sometimes feel that they lose sovereign control over decisions that affect their daily lives and communities. Again, this relationship between the local and the outside the country. And as decisions are taken farther away from the local, that is to say by foreign governments or trade tribunals or through international treaties, people feel a loss of control and demand that their political representatives defend them. I, I just offer a tangent here. This happens not just in small countries like ours of 33 million people. It is very evident in the American political debate right now that although they are the world's unquestioned superpower, it is amazing in talking to Americans, <coughs> as you get to do in these primaries, because politically engaged Americans come out and their Americans are very open, they're happy to talk about their hopes and their fears. A lot of Americans are feeling just what I said, that somehow the world <laughs> has impinged itself on the United States in a way that they sense has changed their country and they are losing control. And it's not just terrorism, which is obvious and has many manifestations in terms of how Americans go about their daily life, but they're running a chronic trade deficit, and they're asking, how is that? Well, it's because the other folks aren't trading fairly. The world isn't treating us well. And where are our allies when we really need them? They don't seem to be with us anymore. And what about all these immigrants who are creeping into the country, especially the illegal ones who are taking our social services? Our country is changing. We're not we don't feel 
We don't feel in our daily lives as secure as you would expect a country's people that is a superpower to feel. So it can even happen in a big country like that. This is very much part of the political dynamic in Europe as they continue to grope forward towards further elements of integration. And it's part of our ongoing political debate. Whether the debate is about the post-Kyoto Treaty, what will that look like? The WTO round, which seems to be in a bit of abeyance at the moment, but you see how fiercely the supply-managed agricultural sectors of our economy uh, defend their acquis, what they've earned in the past every time there's a WTO round. And you see it in reaction to <clears throat> the negative reaction to the bilateral trade deal that we've been trying to negotiate with Korea. So this endemic tension between the local and the global, between political sovereignty and economic space, is part of the world in which we live. And this tension between political sovereignty and economic space is always manifest in Canada because we live next to the U.S. And the gap between the size and the power of the two countries is obvious. And we can be sideswiped by actions in the United States that are actually directed towards other countries. We can be ignored by the United States because despite the fact that we think the world needs more Canada, the Americans actually can go about their business without paying a lot of attention to us. And we certainly in Canada have a strong streak of anti-Americanism, especially on the political left. I have always believed <clears throat> that this reflexive anti-Americanism is unworthy of ourselves and it is also counterproductive. It leads in particular to the deadliest of all Canadian sins. And we have a number, but the deadliest is moral superiority which in turn leads to that beguiling and dangerous chapter slogan that the world needs more Canada. We don't need to feel good about Canada by feeling badly about the Americans. <coughs> Indeed, this moral superiority, which is our deadliest sin, can lead us to ignore reflecting on our own problems because we take comfort that however we have problems, they have worse ones. And you can see this clearly in our number one domestic discussion over the last 10 years, which is health care. How many times, whatever you think of our health care system, how many times did we hear politicians and defenders of our system dismiss all criticisms of our system, all suggestions for change of our system, as the slippery slope towards U.S.-style two-tier medicine? Monsieur Chrétien used to say, down there, down there, they check your wallet before your pulse. Oh, gee, we can't have that. When you do three-quarters of your trade, as we do with the United States, when about 30 percent of your GNP depends on that trade, when you have a host of continental issues to deal with because geography made it so, everything from policing to the environment to immigration to air and maritime space, it seems at least prudent to me that you would want to have constructive and straightforward relations at the very least with the United States. We don't have to agree with them on all issues of foreign policy to maintain a constructive and straightforward relationship. And we have an unexpected opportunity now to excel in this kind of internationalization of ourselves, even though, or perhaps I should say, almost because we live next to the United States. They are the world's most powerful and affluent country, but because of what's happened in the last seven years, it is now one of the world's least admired countries. Evidence from a variety of worldwide surveys, from the Pew Center to the Maryland surveys to the Gallup poll, illustrates that the Bush administration has made the U.S. extremely unpopular all around the world, <clears throat> except for a few places. And so there actually is no better time for us to go international than while the United States, notwithstanding its military incursions in certain parts of the world, is actually shrinking in terms of its international horizons, partly for the reasons I just spoke about, namely the sense that the world is putting itself upon the United States. And so while respecting and nurturing and protecting the economic space that we share with the United States, a space upon which our livelihood depends, we should try to become more international in our politics and in our domestic arrangements while they 
go through this difficult period in their history. And our competitive advantage doesn't lie in the world in becoming more American if by more American it means we become more like Kansas or Dallas, but rather by becoming more Canadian if by that we mean more internationally connected, better trained, more outward and therefore more confident in ourselves without falling victim of that trap of moral superiority. Just another comment about the U.S. While we did, as I say, line up properly our social and economic situations and so stabilized our finances, the Americans have gone in the other direction. Because they've been amassing a huge national debt, which is growing rapidly, nine trillion and counting, a trillion of which is held by the Chinese. <coughs> and they also have a federal deficit. They have a chronic trade deficit. They have high levels of personal indebtedness. And states are struggling everywhere. They run out of tricks. They've used their tobacco settlement money. They've issued new bonds. They've rolled over debt. And these states are going to have to cut and are cutting spending. And cutting means it's already happening for universities, for schools, and health care. And so while we contract, they contract, we should be expanding as we have given ourselves the capacity to do as long as we do it in ways that increase our capacity to compete globally. Our high school students, for example, are already doing considerably better than American high school students in international tests. U.S. healthcare spending is rising as a share of GDP even more rapidly than is ours, incredible as that might seem. Our Canada pension plan is fully protected, so we're told, for as far as one can see. I have no reason to suggest otherwise. I wasn't trying to make a sarcastic comment. Their social security system is not, and they haven't yet figured out how to fix it. And the chairman of the Federal Reserve was before the House Committee last week and said, not only do we have a $9 trillion debt and a deficit, we also have huge unfunded liabilities for Medicaid and social security, Madam and Mr. Congressman. Our government debt is declining, theirs is rising. In other words, our fundamentals are sound and theirs are not. So this gives us an opportunity. If we use it wisely, although we should be aware that a lot of the world's most recent turbulence in economic times relates to these structural deficits that the Americans have amassed. But we lack some of the tools that we need to succeed in connecting Canada to the world and competing successfully in it. And one of them, <clears throat> one of these weaknesses is in <clears throat> what policy wonk types call human skills development. Because by some accounts, a quarter of our high school students don't graduate. And perhaps another quarter don't go further. Studies of all kinds show that three quarters of the jobs being created, the new jobs, depend on some form of post high school education. And the job market for those with more limited educational skills is shrinking. And our private sector, and I like to tell the business community this, they don't like to hear it, but the stats are there. Our private sector does not do, on an international basis, a very good job in promoting or financing skills development and training. A conference board report underscored this fact, but many other reports have also done so. And the smaller the firm, of course, the smaller the commitment to training. But even many large companies fail to deliver much training, which is, I suppose, what drove the Quebec government to get frustrated and impose a 1% payroll tax for training purposes. And our country's productivity, our ability to compete in the world, depends on that kind of training, because higher value skills mean an improved ability to compete, and compete we must more than ever before in an interconnected world. Everyone these days is transfixed by China and India. Oh, the Harper government's not transfixed by China, but that's another matter. How do we compete with that? Well, we can't on the terms in which they produce. What is more important for us than being transfixed by their lower wages and weaker environmental standards is that the Chinese are now churning out thousands and thousands and thousands of engineers, scientists, technicians, mathematicians, and other highly educated individuals as part of their great national awakening. 
So before we acquiesce in the insistent demands from the large corporations and their newspaper acolytes for lower taxes, we might ask of them, why is the Canadian private sector by world standards, according to the OECD and the conference board, so poor at human capital development? Fix that problem at the same time as we talk about your tax cuts. And I also think, although this is a controversial matter, that the high degree of foreign ownership in key sectors of the Canadian economy militates against investments in skills, training, and human resource development. Branch plants breed branch plant mentalities. Head offices are where the very best and most critical jobs are in multinational companies. And we just don't have enough world-class companies headquartered here in Canada, and I am distressed at the acquiescence, the eagerness with which boards of directors and CEOs of Canadian companies are selling them to foreign interests. We shouldn't, we can't bring back the days of the Foreign Investment Review Agency and build walls around Canada, but government policy has to be focused, in my view, on what it takes to build and sustain world-class Canadian companies as part of the international agenda that I'm trying to outline. And that might in turn, that might in turn, involve allowing companies that we already think within our little market are too big, i.e. companies like banks, to get bigger. Because the economic space, it isn't Canada anymore. And there are two other great human skills questions that we need to address, and I'm only going to mention them and not develop an argument. The first is the emergence of uh, the evidence, the emerging evidence of an immigrant underclass. And the second is Aboriginal underachievement. Multiculturalism, as I said, is an advantage in Canada's quest for global connectedness, and multiculturalism stems from immigration. But four different studies in the last two years, from Immigration Canada, from Statistics Canada, from the Canadian Labour and Business Centre, and from the C.D. Howe Institute, have all pointed to an emerging immigrant underclass. They don't call it that way because they want to be more polite. The low income rate for recent immigrants was 23% in 1980 and is now 35%. And in Canada's bigger cities, bigger than Halifax, general incomes, general incomes are not becoming more unequal unless you factor in those low income arrivals. And so my view, again, controversial, but I'm not running for anything, is that rather than having, and the mayor of New Glasgow will probably bite my head off when I say this, Rather than Ottawa drilling a spigot into its own revenues and letting some of those revenues flow to the municipalities, a policy that defies every elementary notion of accountability, Ottawa should be spending more of that money on the integration, language training, and skills development of immigrants whose numbers Ottawa keeps pushing up year after year and whose problems Ottawa keeps pushing down on municipalities, school boards, welfare agencies, and settlement houses. A word about <clears throat> an immensely complicated and fraught subject of Aboriginals. They have made great strides in the last century, in the last uh, decade, the last generation, in fact. The number with colleges, college or university degrees has increased sharply. Many are now employed, especially in natural resource industries. But still, it's perhaps less relevant in this province, but it certainly hits you smack in the face if you're on the prairie provinces or elsewhere, that we have to have a substantial upgrading of educating and training Aboriginals for jobs in the modern economy. Because you can wax nostalgic about the traditional ways, and you can even write a multi-volume Royal Commission extolling those ways, but on-reserve employment prospects, no matter what form of self-government you dream up, are going to be thin to non-existent except for public sector ones, unless you're lucky enough to be on land that has a multiple uh, of natural resources. The plain hard fact that a whole bunch of people don't want to talk about in this country is that reservations are dead-end employment streets, even though the entire thrust of Aboriginal policy has not acknowledged this brutal reality, but instead has wandered around in search of land claim agreements and court cases affirming rights while Aboriginals have been leaving reserves and going to urban areas. And finally, and I 
want to stress this point, especially before this audience. <clears throat> there is post-secondary education colleges and universities whose role is critical for internationalizing Canada and preparing for the future. I don't say this just to curry favor with this audience. Universities have been underfunded in Canada for a generation. And this underfunding can be demonstrated in a number of ways. I'm not going to take you through all of them, but here are only three very quickly. Between 1980 and 2002, government investments in public four-year universities, public now, public, we're not talking about Harvard or Stanford, public four-year universities in the United States where they're supposed to underfund all their public services, part of the Canadian moral superiority. In the States between 1980 and 2002, government investments in public four-year universities rose by 25%. In real terms, in real terms, after inflation. In Canada, again, in real terms, in that same time frame, government investments in universities declined by 20%. From the mid-1980s until 2003, health care as a share of total provincial spending across the country rose from 30 percent to 35 percent, and in most provinces is now over 40 percent. In my province, Ontario, it's 44 percent of all non-debt spending. And nobody in Ontario has the foggiest idea to stop it anywhere near 44. It's going to 50 soon. And during that same period of time, same period of time, post-secondary education share of total provincial spending declined from 7.5% to 6%. 20 years ago, therefore, the ratio of health care spending to post-secondary education spending was 4 to 1, and as of 2003, it was 6 to 1. <clears throat> if we put a billion dollars to pick a number, into hiring more professors to increase teaching and access at post-secondary institutions, we'd be doing a lot more for our future than spending another billion dollars on health care. Indeed, it's curious that we talk about a shortage of doctors, <clears throat> but we don't ever talk about a shortage of professors. We lament long waiting lists, but we don't talk about large and increasing class sizes. We refuse user fees for seeing a doctor, as is used in places like Sweden and other countries, but we accept ever higher user fees for the students who attend university. We've got our priorities wrong if we're trying to prepare ourselves for the future, an international and a learning future. Because universities are among society's incubators of ideas, innovations, and notions of social responsibility. And if we're going to pursue the path of becoming one of the most globally interconnected countries on earth, as we must, then these incubators, these colleges, these universities have to be in the forefront of that connectedness. And there are a variety of ways that the universities themselves, regardless of this funding problem, can better prepare themselves and their students. For example, Statistics Canada reported in 2006 that the number of foreign students enrolled in Canadian universities continues to rise, but that news sounded better than the reality, because although the raw number edged up, the proportion of foreign students actually remained quite low at only 6%. Relative to our total student body, nationally speaking, our university student population is not more international than six or seven years ago, although in absolute terms the number of foreign students has gone up. But that's only one way of measuring internationalization. There's the curriculum. Are the universities asking themselves, is it, the curriculum, as globally minded as we need it for the students of tomorrow in an increasingly global world? Are we designing enough programs for students to live and work as part of their experience in other countries? Are these institutions sufficiently linked and tied to other institutions? Are we encouraging? No, are we demanding in certain courses that students learn foreign languages. Are we demanding that? So global success, I think, is going to depend more than anything else on the brains, on the interconnectedness, and on the outwardness of Canadians in the future. Every policy that you as future public servants 
think about should be measured in part by the degree to which it moves Canada towards that success. And then we need national leaders, and maybe some of you will be among them, who will articulate this vision and the policies that flow from that vision. Who will be, who will be the first political leader in the country to frame the vision and to explain its urgency? I think that whoever does will be the dominant politician of the next decade. Thank you.